Okay. All right, everyone. So welcome to part two of my interview with David Chatka. Um, we are going to continue where we left off. Hopefully I can, I, you know, I have the right place. Um, but we were talking about um, prayer and healing and things like that. So I think we left off where I wanted to know um, if, um, what are the four kinds of prayers for healing? Well, really, really there's, there's, there's four approaches. Uh, the first uh, is what I call the prayer for the miracle. And this is, this is well known. This is where, okay, so Rocky Balboa is, you know, fighting the fight. <laughs> and his wife winds up in a terrible way and he sits in the chapel until she gets better. The second is what I call the pathway to a remedy, um, where you are looking for a medical solution for the situation that you're in. The third is what I call the combo, where you have an intervention, it gives you a direction, you start to sense a little bit of miraculous transformation, you're guided to a, to a pathway to a remedy. And in the middle of that, you have a divine intervention. And the last is healing on the other side of the grave, where you come to peace with God and you're on the other side of that. And all of those uh, have God's blessing sitting on top of them, all of them. And uh, there, there's kind of a, there's a bunch of flaky teaching out there that tries to put antagonism between medicine and miracle. And I don't buy that at all. And I don't see it even in scripture. It's a false antagonism. In fact, one of my favorite stories is the story of a king by the name of Hezekiah. And Hezekiah was one of the great ones. He was one of the good ones. And uh, he gets afflicted in some kind of a terrifically awful way. And one of the big prophets, Isaiah the prophet, walks into his room and says to him, you're dead. <laughs> put, your, put your house in order. It's over. And uh, Hezekiah, turns his face to the wall and he cries out to God and he said, God, remember what I did all my life. I, I upheld held your law as far as I was able, et cetera. He, he, he doesn't even say, heal me. He just says, remember what I've done. And then Isaiah, the prophet who's written, you know, this, this big book of 66 chapters, he turns around because God interrupts him and says, go back and tell Hezekiah, the leader of my people, that I have heard his prayer. I have seen his tears. I am going to add 15 years to his life. And so he goes back in and he tells him this. And then this most amazing thing happens. Hezekiah says, prove it. <laughs> so Isaiah says, do you want the shadow to go backwards or forwards? 10 steps. And Hezekiah says, don't give me the easy one. Give me the one that's contrary to ordinary science. You know, so, so Isaiah cries out, the shadow goes backwards. 10 steps. And then when it's done, the, the prophet says to him, here's what you got to do. Get yourself a fig poultice and put it over top of the boil and suck the poison out and you're going to be fine. <laughs> so he gets a nature miracle. He gets two prophetic utterances and he gets medicine. And all of that was in combination. And so it's one of those stories. By the way, if, if people are interested to know where that's found, it's in the 38th chapter of the book of the prophet Isaiah. It's found in there. It's also found in 2 Kings, but, but it's easy to remember Isaiah 38. I think it's because I wish I was forever 38, but I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> At any rate, that story is my favorite for lots of reasons. It involves faith. It involves contact with God. It involves medicine and it involves miracle. And all of those things are in magnificent combination. And all four things are in that because he's not given eternal you know, life forever and ever. What he's given is 15 more years. And then, of course, he dies. And then his son gets raised up to become the next king and so on. But for him, he needed to know. He had to have some, some standard proof. And then he's given a medicine to fix it. And so I, I don't, I, I see medicine and miracle as uh, parallel tracks that are going down the road. And from time to time, there's an entrance lane where the two of them overlap. Uh, and then from time to time, they diverge. And there are seasons where medicine runs up and it can do no more for you. And at that point, you cry out to God and you ask him to make you well, uh, despite the fact that medicine has told you that it, it's reached its limit. And I have seen people who have been healed, including uh, my wife and myself and my son, uh, all three of us uh, healed when medicine said that healing was impossible. So in the Healing Prayer book, I, I did send you a copy of that. Uh, I sent you also my wife's uh, note from the medical doctor indicating that he verified this. 
she was healed of something that was impossible to heal. Uh, she was healed of muscular dystrophy. And uh, you got to know, the difference between her before and after was remarkable. Before, she couldn't lift her shoulder, her arms higher than her shoulders. In fact, when I proposed to her, and she said yes, she had to put one, she had to lift, use one arm to put it on my shoulder and the other to go around my waist because she couldn't lift her arms up to give me a hug. And uh, then when she wanted to climb stairs, if she had to climb stairs, and sometimes she had to, she would have to take two hands, lift the leg, position it on the next step, grab hold of the handrail, pull herself up, balance herself, move the other leg up to balance it, and then take the stronger leg and put it on the next step. And that's how she got upstairs. And uh, after she was healed, she ran upstairs. It was the most remarkable, astonishing thing. Now, before this, we had prayed three of those four prayers. We had prayed for a pathway to a remedy. We had prayed for the miraculous intervention. We had prayed for a combo. And we accepted the fact that this healing wasn't going to happen, and then it did. Actually, the telling of that story probably is one of the most remarkable stories of my life. And it, it makes clear to me that uh, I'm not the author of this. <laughs> if I could have healed her 20 years ago, I'd have healed her 20 years ago. You know what I'm saying? It's a, but, I, I, but, 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 but I'm, I'm also aware that God's power is stupendous and profound and miraculous. So do you guys want to hear that story? Is that something you'd be interested in hearing? Do you want to go so different? Is, um, no, I wanted to ask you if um, the healing for her took place before children or after children. After children. In fact, what wow. happened? Yeah, here, so here's what happened. Um, we got married. And then we, we, we um, about two years in, she started, she get, became, became pregnant with our, with our firstborn. Mm -hmm. And she became terrifically ill. Oh, man, terrifically ill. She came that close to dying. In fact, this is the medicine and miracle story that I like to tell. Um, what happened was, uh, we didn't know this because she had two sisters and her mom and none of them manifested this, but she had a genetic liver condition. And when she started to carry our son, um, her liver, first of all, shut down, then it began systematically destroying itself. And so there was a, this deficiency in her liver just stopped it. So she was unable to process bilirubin. And so um, our son inside of her was swimming in poison. And, uh, you know, there, it's, it's one thing for a guy to say he's pro-life. It's another thing altogether for a lady to say, I will not allow the life of that child to be extinguished. If it dies, it dies, but I'm not going to kill it. It's, just, it's very, very different when her life's in jeopardy. Here's what happened. About, um, about three months into the pregnancy, she started getting itchy, and it's called cholestasis of pregnancy. That's not unusual. It happens usually in the third trimester of a pregnancy, but it happened in the first. And that said that something was terrifically wrong. And so um, we start, she started going to see various doctors, and eventually she wound up going to a specialist. And then this specialist took one look at her and, you know, and admitted her to the hospital. And she wound up in, in a very, very high-end hospital, Vancouver Grace Hospital in Metro Vancouver. One of the finest in Canada, one of the finest on earth. And she wound up under the care of a very, very, very fine perinatologist and a world-class hematologist. And the two of them together were the two who were giving care to her. So we were led to what I call a pathway to a remedy. But they could not figure out what was going on with her because she kept getting weaker. If I touched her hand, it would bruise. She was lacking vitamin K and the ability to process that. She was getting weaker and weaker and weaker. And, um, and so the question mark was, was the child viable? And they didn't know. And I remember the moment we went in for the amniocentesis to check this out. And they, they, they put the amnio in and took the fluid out and it came, Keisha came out dark green. It's supposed to come out clear. That means that our son was swimming in that poison. And so they looked at us and they said, if he lives, he'll have cerebral palsy. He'll probably be blind. He'll probably be deaf. And we don't know if the child's viable. So there were three ladies in our church in Vancouver who would pray with her. And, and the way that Liz described this, my wife described this, 
it was like she had bee stings between her breasts on the soles of her feet and on the soles of her hands because the poisons in her system were causing her everything to break down. She was losing her ability to function. She was terrifically weak. She was jaundiced all over. Her eyes were getting quite yellow. She was orange in complexion. And this liver was shut down and it was starting to destroy. In fact, by the end of the seventh month, she'd lost 85% of her liver. And it was this awful kind of thing. And- um, <laughs> Sorry, my husband has got my house hooked up to all kinds of crap and <laughs> technical no difficulty. No problem. Like sensors, you know. Okay, there's no so, problem. Let so if you see me going like this, I'm just trying <laughs> to keep my life on. <laughs> okay, well, I'll finish the story. So the doctor had, saw, saw this thing and he, he basically said to us, um, we have to take this child early and there are two ways to do that. The first is we can put your wife on the medically induced drip and within three or four days, uh, the drip will induce labor and it's the boy inside your womb. And because it's a boy, he, had, he can't produce some of the things that are needed uh, until after he's born. Mom can't give it to him. He has to produce it on his own. And he's a little too young to produce what's needed to make those lungs kickstart. And this was back in the day before we had some of the modern technologies to improve lung efficiency that we do now. But regardless, it meant that if, if he came out of the womb too early, he'd be in an iron lung. And that's not good. So they, they braced us with this kind of news and they said, um, that it's either the drip or we have to do a C-section, but she's weak and the lungs are not properly developed. And if the child passes through the birth canal, it's good for the lungs. Now here's where this thing gets interesting. The church I was serving in Metro Vancouver, and by the way, it's more expensive than New York. It's a terrifically expensive place to live. And that church couldn't afford two pastors. I was the associate pastor in that church. And the lead pastor um, had made the decision that he was on sabbatical. So I was overseeing the congregation. My wife was sick in the hospital. The lead guy wasn't there. And I was trying to figure out if I should stay or not, but they really couldn't afford two pastors. There was a church 2,000 miles away, uh, it, two, fully 2,000 miles. So from Vancouver to, uh, to Chatham, Ontario, this would be like, um, this would be like Seattle to um, Detroit, okay? Anyway, bottom line was, we had tried to figure out what to do, and this church is interested in calling me, and the, there were three ladies in the church who were praying for my wife. The only way she could get relief from that sting was if she took a bath in ice, and then she'd be numb enough that she could sleep for an hour. And if those three ladies prayed, the pain would secede, and she could sleep for five or six hours. So here's what they do. They would call her at a designated time. They would pray she'd go to sleep. And when those three ladies prayed, the level of bilirubin dropped and she began to process some liver function things and her liver enzyme levels came into the high normal range. So they prayed for her and I was able to fly to this church in Southern Ontario that was interested in seeing me. And here's what happened. This is hilarious. I wound up in front of the search committee. They talked to me and there was a guy on that search team who said, look, we're gonna give you the morning off to pray. You can try and figure out if you're supposed to do this. But uh, I'd like to give you a tour of the area before we meet you again on Monday night for a series of questions. I said, oh, sure, that's fine. So he picked me up and it was end of July, start of August, usually 90 degrees Fahrenheit, very hot. And it was really cool. It was like 65 or 66 Fahrenheit. And the guy was wearing a short sleeve shirt and he looked at me and he said, David, would you mind if I just stopped at my house, had a quick chat with my wife and changed my shirt? It's awfully cold. I said, no problem. So I pulled into this guy's house I sit down in his living room and there is a coffee table right beside me. And on the coffee table, there is an open form letter. It was from, a, it was a medical form letter about what it was like to cause women at 31 and 32 weeks gestation to give birth to a male child. <laughs> and they just, the, you know, and this, my wife was at week 31, okay? So I'm looking at this two paragraphs in this open form letter on this coffee table 2,000 miles from where I was just a few days before, knowing they're going to either do a C-section or they're going to do the drip. And I read the two paragraphs, and here's what the two paragraphs said. It said, uh, at 31 to 32 weeks gestation, the male has not developed his lungs. And the best thing for the child is if it passes through the birth canal because the pressure of the birth canal will kickstart the lungs. But there's a 35 to 40% higher incidence of cerebral palsy, 
because the skull case is soft and it pushes in on the child's brain. And so it's possible that that child will be marked forever with cerebral palsy. So I read this, these two paragraphs. I go through this process. I fly back to Vancouver. I get off the plane. I get in my car. I drive straight over to the hospital. I walk into the room and there are eight attending physicians in that room. They are saying, we are waiting for you to get here. Your wife said you would be here at such and such a time. Here is what we have determined to do. We are going to do the drip on your wife. And when the child passes through the uterine canal, it will kickstart the lungs. That's the best thing for the child. Does anybody have any questions? And I said, I only have one. Is it not true that there is a 35 to 40% higher incidence of cerebral palsy at 31 to 32 week old gestational age male preemies when they are put on the uterine drip and they pass through the uterine canal? And everybody in the room stops. <laughs> All of the jaws dropped. My jaw dropped because I was saying this thing from two paragraphs in an open form letter on a coffee table in a house 2,000 miles away. My wife was astonished because she thought I had read every book in the, on the planet. Every medical practitioner in the room looked at me like I was brilliant. All that I had done was read two paragraphs on a form letter. <laughs> so they said, we don't know what to say. And they left the room. And we had to wait until they came back with the rest of what they were gonna proceed with. And nobody came back except the, the, the high-end uh, perinatologist who was the world-class guy. And you gotta know, he could have made the cover of Gentleman's Quarterly. The guy was a knockout kind of looking handsome man with everything perfectly quaffered. His hair was disheveled, his tie was out of place, his buttons were undone. He came in there looking like he had spent the whole day racking his brains and he said, you're gonna have a C-section next Tuesday at 10.35. <laughs> now our son was supposed to be a pound. He came out at four pounds, five ounces. His, his eyesight was perfect and he didn't have cerebral palsy. I am convinced that it was a combination of medicine and miracle and that it was a combination of pathway to a remedy and miraculous intervention. I'm quite convinced of it to this very day. In fact, he's, he's engaged now. He's going to get married soon. Found a nice girl, going to marry her. But um, nice. he's at university now. He's uh, studying to be a teacher. And uh, I mean, he <laughs> sometimes we bang heads together because he talks just like me. <laughs> So we're, we're too much alike, you know, but in regards to that, he's fine. And he was born healthy and he shouldn't have been. That so, is great. Congratulations on all of that, because that is a really like just insane story. <laughs> what, what are the odds? I mean, that I should apply to that church, fly across the country at that window of time and walk into a living room because somebody wanted to change his shirt and see two paragraphs I mean, it's ridiculous. <laughs> the, the odds are absurd. Yeah. That, that is what I call uh, a combination of those four pathways to uh, four, four pathways to healing. And it's also the med medicine and miracle thing. Here's what I want to tell you. I believe in medicine. And without a second hesitation, I would say to anyone who is struggling with whether they should take any kind of medicine, if somebody has dedicated 25 or 30 years to getting that antibiotic in your hand, take the gift. And oh, by the way, Jesus prayed over olive oil before he anointed people with olive oil because it was medicine. Pray over that medicine when you take it and ask God to accelerate the pathway, accelerate it. And I've also seen instant, instantaneous miraculous healing as well. I mean, I've seen that. And I've had, I have medical notes for some of the people where it's occurred. And so I'm a, I'm a complete believer in the unity of the ability to work with the medical community. And there's ditzy writing out there that you should, oh, you're not supposed to trust the doctors, stand on your faith. And there's another group out there that says, don't trust those Christians, stand on medicine. <laughs> and I want to say, a pox on both those houses, <laughs> that the two are supposed to be intertwined on a regular basis. And that what you believe should intersect with how you live. And if there has been research done, and it's it's done with due diligence and excellence. 
receive it as a gift and ask the priest or the pastor or the rabbi to pray with you as you do this to get yourself in a spiritual state where you can imp improve or enhance the healing. So that's, that's part of the burden of the book that I wrote. Uh, here's the problem. There isn't much good writing out there that teaches what I just said to you. Most of it goes one way or the other. Oh, there's nothing to do with this faith stuff. Skip that. Just go for science. And the other side of the equation is, well, if you trust the medical community, you're going to wind up in terrific trouble. Stand on your faith and skip that other thing over there. And I don't see that in the Bible. And I wish that people would just smarten up and read the Bible. Because <laughs> yeah. that's what I see there. Um, so her second pregnancy, was that a little less challenging? Well, here's what happened. 85% uh, of her liver was destroyed. And so um, it, now what I can tell you about this, livers regenerate. But it took her fully seven years for that liver to regenerate to full capacity. We adopted our daughter. And um, she's beautiful. I love her. She also has, now this is, this is interesting. Um, she has muscular dystrophy and we didn't know when we adopted her. Wow. And so now she has, in fact, uh, th this is the book I wrote, I co-wrote this with Dr. Maxie Dunham, just did an interview with him today, this afternoon, as a matter of fact, I'm going to be speaking at a Methodist church in Lexington on this very topic. But what I did in the back of the book, I have a picture of my daughter in her wheelchair going down the road, walking the dog. And we've made a decision that 10% of the proceeds of this book will go to the Muscular Dystrophy Society, whether if I'm paid in the US, then the money goes to the US one, paid in Canada goes to the Canadian one and so on. But um, the, uh, the, the interesting thing was when we adopted her, there was nothing in the record about her having any, any form of muscular dystrophy. And it manifested when she was eight years old. And so she was adopted into a family that knew how to navigate around the issues related to muscular dystrophy. So that's the pathway to a remedy kind of a thing. Now, for the record, there's not a day when I don't pray that she become well. But I don't control that. God does. Now, my wife and my son were both miraculously healed of FSH muscular dystrophy. My daughter was not. And so I live in this in-between where I believe in a pathway through a remedy and I, and, and I receive whatever medical accommodations we can find for our girl because we love her and want to do what's best for her. We pray every time I pray, every time I put her to bed at night, I, have, I go into the room at night, I put my hand on her, I ask the Lord in his mercy to guide us about whether we're supposed to pray for a healing or what, what's it supposed to be. And sometimes I pray for healing, sometimes I linger. But when the day is done, what really matters is that we bring her into the presence and love her. So we have to. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Look at that. So that is a great segue into when God says no versus when he says yes. Yes. So I don't know. Just tell us a little bit about your thoughts on when God says no versus when God says yes. I mean, we definitely know what the no's are because the no's are usually the things that we're hoping for. And sometimes um, they say God, God's uh, prevention is God, uh, prevention, wait, God's prevention is God's protection. Something like that. I'm really bad at re reciting things, but you know, sometimes when you get a no to something or things don't happen the way you want them to or the way you pray for them to happen, it's all for the best. That means yeah. that that's not what was supposed to happen or, you know, supposed to be received. So tell us a little bit about your thoughts on when God says no versus when he says yes. Well, actually, I just told you the most important part of my life around this. And what I've learned is that he's God and we're not. And there are markers to tell you when you're praying into the healing and when the healing is not going to happen. So um, let me try to say it this way. When I'm in the middle of one of those moments where there is a manifestation of a miracle, I'm usually very aware because uh, a couple of things happen to me. Uh, one is I get what I call a laser focus on the person that I'm praying for. 
And the next thing that happens is my, my, my internal being begins to expand with a sense of presence. And the only way I can describe it is, it's like a velvety smooth assurance of warmth in behind my emotional state that waxes large. And it's filled with fire, peace, and holy conviction. And then the next thing that happens is I get a picture in my head of that person becoming well. That's the only way I can describe what it looks like. I don't know what it's like for anybody else. That's just what it's like for me. And very often there'll be a scripture that will come and I'll say the scripture to that person and it'll be something they've been reflecting on or whatever. And then my hand gets very hot when I start to pray. In fact, it just happened two weeks ago. I found out uh, last uh, Tuesday night, I was in North Carolina doing an event at a Lutheran church. And while I was down there, um, we were preaching, I was preaching on prayer for healing and wound up preaching from the book of James chapter five. And of course, if you're gonna preach on that, what are you gonna do? You should, you should pray for people. <laughs> so at the end of the service, there was a couple that came forward and I was praying with them. And that's exactly what happened. He had had um, a terrific back trouble. He had a ruptured disc and he had uh, sciatica down one side of his body and he was in chronic pain. And he and his wife came forward, faithful Christian people. And he wondered if I would pray for his healing. And I did exactly what the Bible says. I made the sign of the cross on his forehead with some oil and I prayed for him. And while I was praying, and there were three of us, there was the pastor of the local church. There was a, a friend of mine who traveled with me to North Carolina and there was me. And we were praying. And while we were praying, that profound sense of peace and fire and conviction rose up inside of me. And as I prayed for him, my hand began to tingle and I felt this fire going inside of him. So, I offered a course to that church, which is, was on Tuesday nights, and his wife took the course. And so last Tuesday, um, we we're in the class, and she said, oh, by the way, Pastor David, I have to tell you what happened to Gary. And I said, what happened? We said, well, it really ticked me off because he didn't tell me. I said, well, what did he not tell you? <laughs> he, said, she, he went to the men's group and told the men's group that when you prayed for him, the sciatica vanished and his back became straight. And then after he told the men's group, he realized he hadn't told me yet. So he came home and he told me. <laughs> At any rate, his back was completely healed. It just, it just happened. And so then actually he tripped and he wound up on his back. And usually that would produce excruciating pain and he'd howl. And he just got up and he was fine. And she watched it. So she told our Tuesday night group that that was happening. And there were 15 people from that church on that call. So that was quite exciting. But there were other people and I prayed for them. And I did not sense any of that happening. Faithful Christian people, one, a missionary who had served overseas in the Middle East. And uh, this lady had put her life on the, on, the, on the line for the gospel. She was older. She wanted to pray that, her, 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 um, that, the, that the arched back that she had would straighten up. She wanted to pray that her balance would get better. And I prayed with her. And I sensed nothing happening there. And um, she's in the class on the Tuesday night together with this lady. And you could see the question mark on her face because when I prayed with Gary, it happened. When I prayed with Grace, it didn't. And it was the same event. <laughs> it was the same people praying <laughs> and it didn't happen. So the only thing I can tell you is God initiates, we respond. And what we need to do is to learn to pay attention to those signals when the Lord is at work and you join him in his labor. That's yeah. the only way I can describe how this works. And for me, yeah. the signals are always the same. There's an increase of awareness of the Lord and the person you're praying for. There's an mm -hmm. increase in peace and there's an increase in joy. And then suddenly you get this sense of faith and you know beyond all knowing it's gonna happen. And, and when, you, when you're in the middle of that, for some reason, God has ordained that a human instrument has to pray into these things before them to happen. Don't ask me to explain the predestination free will thing or why God uses a human agent and why it doesn't. That's too big a topic for 20 minutes. <laughs> we won't get into that. But what I can tell you is when the presence increases and you become aware, you focus and you don't ask the question, how come Grace didn't get healed, but Gary did? You focus on Gary. And as you, then when you're done, you offer pastoral care to Grace and you see that she gets herself a pathway to a remedy. That's what you do. I don't have any answer to why God heals one and not another, except that in the ministry of Jesus, 
he always did exactly what the father told him. He, he says it, and the, the, the clearest case of this is in John chapter 5, and he walks into this place where there's hundreds of sick people, hundreds of them. It's the pool of Bethesda, and everybody's hanging around for the waters to get stirred up so that they can all jump in the water and get healed first. So the first one in gets healed. And he walks into this place, and he sees a guy who's been sick for 38 years. That's a long time sick. In fact, I don't think, you don't even look 38. <laughs> you don't have to tell me how old you are. You look 35. But so as long as you're alive, okay, about, no, 38 years is a long, long time. So if he got sick at 12, he's 50. That means he's never worked a day in his life. First thing Jesus says to him is, do you want to be well? And the guy says, well, you know, I kind of want to get in the water, but I can't there because I'm too sick to get in. The Lord tells him to pick up his bed and walk. And the interesting thing about that narrative, he doesn't even know who Jesus is. <laughs> God, God heals him. He's, and so the, some people walk up and say, how come you're carrying the bed in the Sabbath? He said, well, some guy told me to pick up my bed and walk. And then Jesus walks up to him, sneaks up to him from behind. Says, oh, by the way, that was me. And then he tells the Pharisees, the Pharisees find him. And they said, how come you made that guy pick up his bed on the Sabbath day? And then Jesus engages in a bit of ironic humor. Because these guys are basically saying, our rules honor God. And he said, oh, okay, okay, boys, it's all right. Don't worry about this. The God you love, he's the God who told me to break that rule. <laughs> and then he says this interesting thing. I can do nothing unless the Father shows me. And the things that he shows me, I do. In other words, he saw the healing for the one guy. He didn't see the healing for the 200 people in the ward. And he cooperated with what he received, not with what he yearned to be able to do. And I'll just tell you something, if I could control this gift, I would just walk into that hospital and tap them all on the shoulder and get out of there. You know, the only people I wouldn't buy, the only work, nurses working would be the obstetric and gynecology department so that babies could be born. <laughs> Everybody else, all the cancer doctors would be out of a job. I just go in there and just tap them. All those AIDS doctors, I just cure all those AIDS people and all those, any, any kind of affliction you want to name, I just tap them all. But I don't have that power. God has that power. And he bestows it when it suits his purposes. But I think it's far more frequent than most uh, imagine. So this last Tuesday, I heard about two of them. There was a lady named Shirley who, um, who had cancer. And um, I prayed for her three months ago. And I was on a Zoom call just like this. And the next thing you know, we have this profound sense that we're all supposed to pray for Shirley. We started praying for her. And we sense something happened. You know, you know how you just get this profound sense that this is something powerful has happened. Well, she was on a Thursday call with me. And she said, Pastor David, cancer's gone not a trace of cancer in my body. We know who got that. So in the last week, I've heard of two of these things. And I think it's supposed to be ordinary. It's supposed to be common, but I don't believe that you can manipulate it. And the reason I wrote the book with, with Maxi is because there's so much bad, ugly teaching out there about miracles being either automatic or not at all. Yeah, I was gonna ask you <laughs> what your thoughts are on, you know, um sometimes you see on tv like these pastors i don't even know if they're real pastors but they're like touching people on the head and they're falling back and you know that well, whole sometimes thing. okay for the record for the record i have seen people who have received healing that way right okay. um i have also seen people who thought they received healing that way and it was not true <laughs> So um, one of the, one, so I won't name the guy because we have to be careful about naming names, but there was one uh, fellow who did a great big conference and my sister-in-law who also, she still does have muscular dystrophy. She wanted to go and be close to that fellow to see if he would pray for her. And she was shuffled off into a back room and put in an area where it was hard for her to access the front. And they put the almost well people up at the front who could have what appeared to be a placebo effect. And it was so disappointing to see that. Now, compare that to what I saw when I went to tribal Africa. I was doing uh, what was called a college of prayer. I wound up in North Uganda and I worked in a little town called Arua. It was actually Idi Amin's birthplace. 
It's where he kept his harem, actually. He had several females there. And it was the, also the area that was ravaged by that awful warlord, Joseph Coney. And two American churches in my congregation in just outside of Edmonton, Alberta, partnered together to help that region rebuild after Coney had been gone and Idi Amin had, was gone. So I was in this place and we had an outdoor ministry thing where we, I, I taught 750 pastors. This um, you told us about them healing your wife. Yeah, no, that, that's, this is before this. This is about- Oh, this okay. Is so this, the first time I saw this kind of miraculous thing happen, and this is what led to my wife. Um, okay. Uh, so this, this, this preacher was standing on the platform and I had got up and I'd, I'd spoken to the 50,000 people in the crowd, but all the very sick people were at the front. The ones who were desperately ill were right at the front. And I was in a, I was under a tent because people like me would get sunburned terrifically badly in the Ugandan sun. And so they had, they had a place for people who were not from Uganda and we were sitting there and I was maybe 15 feet away from a lady who was paralyzed sitting on a dirty board. And it was not hard to see a fly going up into her eye and she couldn't even move her hand to knock the fly off. And she couldn't close her eyelash to get the fly away from her eye. She was totally paralyzed. The preacher on the platform said, uh, the anointing of the spirit for healing is on me. And he walked off the platform and he touched that lady's hand. And then he went back and he finished his sermon. When he touched her hand, her hands began to move. And I'd been watching her for two hours. Her hands began to move. There was another lady not too far over from me who was a radio person from uh, the city of Gulu. And her name was Elizabeth Queen and we called her Queen Elizabeth. <laughs> Right away. But she looked over at that lady and she walked over and took her by the hand and began to pray over her. And I watched as this woman who had not been able to move stood to her feet and began to move her arms and her shoulders around just like this. And then she began to walk like she had stumps for legs. And then she began to bend her legs and move and turn her arms and shoulders. And then she began to walk like she was a baby trying to get her balance. And then I watched her run back and forth across the field. <sighs> I have five yeah. American witnesses for that. That's why I invited that man into my pulpit. And when he came and had that word about my wife in that medical condition, she was dramatically healed. But I saw like 25 of those within a cluster of time with the very sick people brought up to the front where they could easily access the prayer teams. In a, as opposed to these guys on television who hide the really sick people in the back of the room. So what I'm trying to say is there are charlatans out there who take advantage of what I call the placebo effect and try and make money. And there are the real items out there too, the real deal groups, the, the ones who are legitimate. Probably the best book on prayer for healing that was ever written was written by a Roman Catholic guy named Francis McNutt. He just passed away. He was like 90 when he died. But he wrote a book called Healing in 1974. Uh, that was, uh, until recently, probably the very best book on prayer for healing because the guy wasn't trying to make any money. He took a vow of poverty, right? He was not trying to manipulate anything. But I met people who were prayed over by Francis McNutt and they became quite well. They became quite well. It was remarkable. And, wow. Um, yes. And so this is, this is where the launch happened. But of course, um, I've seen this myself and uh, I've, I've watched my wife and my son recover from muscular dystrophy. So um, what, how do you know that you have this ability or how would you know if you had this ability or that you have been, like I was telling you, my cousin's friend who's a pastor, she, you know, felt like she needed to pray for certain people. And I guess, you know, when you're a pastor, you're probably a little bit more connected than someone like me, you know? So how would you know if you have the ability to pray and God would use you to heal someone? Well, you'll trip into it, sister. <laughs> <laughs> you, you won't be able to get away from it. If the Lord taps you, you'll have the gift. Here's what it would, now, then here's the reality. Different gifts are given to different people so that God gets the glory and not us. That's what the Bible says. And I really believe in what's called community. 
And I don't believe that there should be individuals who don't have accountability attached to them. I think people need to be attached to a local church. I think they need to be attached to a board of control. I think there needs to be checks and balances in what you do. But the best way to discover your spiritual gifts is to start hanging around with other people who walk in those gifts. And as you do, you'll discover if you're being tapped for that gift or this gift over here or that gift over there. And you, you won't be the one who will recognize it. Others will recognize it for you. And so um, <laughs> I had a funny thing. Is there, there used to be a bunch of things called spiritual gift inventories. And you'd, you'd, you'd figure out what you thought, what your, what your gifts would be. And what would happen is the ones you yearned for, the ones you checked off, <laughs> you, you did self-fooling. You, you know. And so I remember I had some fun with this. I had an elder board. And I had the elder board do this thing. And I ha secretly asked their wives, their spouses, to write down what their gifts were. And there were 12 elders. And only one of them had the same gifts listed as their wives did. <laughs> only one of them. But when you're in a community and the gifts start to emerge, the most amazing things happen. So uh, let me tell you what happened in that retreat. There was a guy by the name of Henry. Henry was a delightful fella. He wanted to always train the next board chair. And so there was a young guy um, who was in his 30s, you know, and um, Henry was in his 60s, and he wanted to train the young guy. And so uh, we wound up staying at this retreat center. It was a two-day event. We were trying to figure out what we we're going to do for the next year in the life of the church. And I wound up rooming with the young guy. His name was Doug. And uh, he told the story publicly, so I can tell you this. Anyway, um, he, he was a muscular, handsome guy. Uh, he's one of these guys who always hung out in his dad's garage and they would bang, you know, move parts around to get his hands covered with grease. And he liked fixing things and that kind of thing. He was also a very good salesman and he, that's how he earned his living. Anyway, this guy, Doug, woke up in the morning and I woke up in the morning and he said, um, set your alarm 15 minutes early. So I did. And then he said, uh, I can't get up until I take my medicine. I said, oh, and so he had to crawl out of bed and he had to crawl along the wall to get his balance until he took his um, medicine for dizziness because he had something called Meniere's disease, which affects your balance, right? Anyways, he's a handsome guy who had this Meniere's disease and he would have to do pills every six hours. And it would take about 20 minutes to be effective. So he had us get up 15 minutes early, he took his pill. And after 15, 20 minutes, he was able to walk down and have breakfast with me. So he's chairing the meeting because he's in training. And I am in the middle of teaching something. And Henry, the past board chair, looks at me and says, Pastor David, we're supposed to pray for Doug. I said, well, wait till I finish my teaching, Henry. I'm not done. <laughs> and I'm waxing hot. I'm teaching something. And he said, well, Pastor David, we have to do it. And I'm waxing, you know, I'm, I'm waxing eloquent. I'm doing this deep thing on a chalkboard, right? And he said, Pastor David, we have to do it now. And he stands up and he walks over and he puts his hand on Doug. And he starts to pray. Doug felt his ears start to burn with fire. And then he felt peaceful. We continued with the retreat and we went through the entire day. Doug forgot to take his medicine and he didn't need it. So he, he got called by his wife because his daughter wanted to talk to him. And then he, uh, because he started talking to his daughter, he didn't realize that he forgot to take his medicine. He drove all the way home. It was an hour and a half home. And then he, you know, hugged his kids, played with his kids, kissed his wife, went to bed, woke up the next day, came to worship. And he realized when he was at worship, he'd missed three doses of his medication. And he was not dizzy. He was cured of Meniere's disease. <laughs> <laughs> now, None of us was trying to do that. I was trying to teach from my chalkboard a principle for the elder board. <laughs> and and the, the, the guy who was the, the fellow said, we got to pray for him. He wasn't planning on doing that because he was a keener on training. And Doug, all he wanted to do was get through the meeting and go home and hug his kids. And God initiated, Henry responded. And the whole elder board watched that guy get well. Then his doctor, wow. went, yeah. It's just, so you respond to the divine initiative and here's what it looks like. Your heart starts to burn with fire. You feel a sense of compassion for the other and you cannot help yourself, you must pray.
That's exactly what happened to Henry, who had never in his life ever done that before. In fact, he's still the chairman of that church board in Spruce Grove, Alberta. His name's Henry Bannon. He testified, so I can tell you the story. Anyway, he was a high-end business guy. And his goal was to bring good business practice into that elder board so we could organize well. That was his goal. And uh, he wound up being used in prayer for healing to heal God. <laughs> you never know when you're going to be called. So no, That's exactly it. That's exactly it. But you will know you're being tapped because you will have a yearning to pray for that person and you won't be able to help yourself. Compassion will fill your heart. And the next thing you know, you'll be beside them and then you will feel it. The anointing of the Lord will come on you and it will flow into them. So what do you want people to take away from your book, Healing Prayer and God's Idea? But healing Prayer is God's idea. What I want them to oh. take away, yeah, certainly. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> no, sorry. Yeah. Healing Prayer is healing God's prayer. idea. That's yeah, it. Well, the title know. is exactly what the book's trying to teach that it's not something that we just make up or do because it's a nice little duty or a custom. We do it because it's God's idea. And that what we're supposed to do is open ourselves to the possibility the Lord himself might actually use us to do this. And then to, actually the book is designed to be a primer. Or you say primer in the States, I think. Anyway, regardless of this, up here it's called a primer, down there you call it a primer. But it's designed to be an introductory guide with several healing stories interspersed that are all medically verified. I wanted to teach people that healing prayer is not just for the charlatans, it's not for the guys who just make money, but it's an ordinary thing. It's something that belongs to the ministry of Christ's church. And it doesn't matter if you're a Catholic or a Baptist or a Pentecostal or a Mennonite or a Methodist or whatever, it doesn't matter. It matters that you're a servant of Jesus and that when he initiates, we can respond. And that the Lord can use anybody to do this. It doesn't matter if you're somebody who's flamboyant and speaks well, or if you're somebody who has a problem with stuttering. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're man or female or young or old. It doesn't matter if you're a beginning Christian or somebody who's walked with the Lord for de decades. It, what matters is that you make yourself available to him. And that when someone who is desperate because they're sick asks you to pray, that you know how to go about that. Now, if you read the first story in the book, I tripped into the, the stuff. I mean, I, I wasn't trying to do it. And then I discovered that there was nobody out there teaching us how to do it. There was only that Catholic book that I told you about. That was it. There wasn't much in the way of writing on healing prayer. So my burden is to train people. So, so George ain't average. Who cares what nation you're from? Who cares what color you are? Who cares what, whether you're young or old? Whether, who cares if you're, if you're a seasoned believer or just getting started? What matters is that you be given the tools you need to be able to do the ministry that Jesus would assign to you. And so the book is designed to do that. So Maxie Dunham, who's the other author of this and I are both prairie equippers. We train people. So that's the goal for the resource. No problem. So please tell us where we can find this book and where we can connect with you and keep up with all of the things that you are doing. Sure. Well, the easiest way to get the book is to go to Amazon.com and just look up the title. Healing Prayer is God's Idea. And you can get a Kindle version or you can get, a, you can get uh, the, the paperback. Paperback takes a little longer because they print it. And, it. and if you're one of these Amazon Plus guys, you, know, you can get a bunch of those copies and ship for nothing if you get order above a particular threshold. That's easy. But if you want to be in touch with me, I, I do conferences and I do events and I'd be delighted to be booked to come to a church or to a conference or anything like that around these themes, you go to my website, which is www.spirit, like Holy Spirit, equip, like equipment, spiritequip.com. And that's my uh, website. And there you can sign up for blogs. And there I publish the conferences that I'm doing or the courses that I'm teaching. And if you wanted to have a direct conversation with me, it's very simple. Use my name, David Chotka. Now, maybe that's hard. <laughs> David Chotka at spiritequip.com. And I did tell my, uh, my computer guys, if they don't remember the last name, David at spiritequip.com gets sent there. It's what happens. So, so that would work too. But uh, that's the easiest way to be in touch with me. And uh, of course, I do respond to emails and invitations and so on. And I, it's, a, it's a delight uh, to be able to travel to other communities of faith and to come alongside them. 
Well, thank you so much, Reverend David, for coming on Side Talk and sharing your journey with me and sharing well with me and my listeners and just um, letting us get to know you a little bit and listen in on the experiences that you've had with healing and just, you know, the amazing things that you've witnessed and has also happened in your life. Um, we really appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me as a guest, and uh, I'm I'm just thankful for the opportunity. Absolutely. All right. 